The voice of God calls us to awaken in him. How will he find us when he comes? Awake and ready. And when he asks us to dedicate ourselves more perfectly, how will he find us? Awake, Awake and ready. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, dearest friend, dearest friend beloved, God, beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow before Thee. Divine Mother, Bless us with an experience of your presence. Bless us with an experience of your presence. Help us to open our hearts. Help us to open our hearts. That we can receive your love. That we can receive your love. To open our minds. To open our minds. That we may receive your wisdom. That we may receive your wisdom. And your guidance. And your guidance. As we follow this path. As we follow this path. Back home to thee. Give us the will, Give us the will and, the perseverance and the perseverance to take this path, to take this path all, the way, all the way, filled with joy, filled with joy sharing love. Sharing love. Oh, oh. Peace. peace. Amen. Amen. While still meditating, let's listen to these words self-confidence, written by Swami Kriyananda. Self-confidence, as it is normally understood, recalls to mind images of army generals and cowboy heroes, people, in short, who know their blacks from their whites. But life's alternatives are usually much more complex. Self-confidence on the spiritual path is of another order altogether. It means confidence in the inner self, not in the ego. It means living from within, living by truth rather than by opinions. It means living by what God wants, not by what man wants. Thus, it means living by faith in the sure knowledge that although man is fallible, God is infallible. Let's affirm together. I live in the assurance of God's truth within. I live in the assurance of God's truth within. In my inner self and not in the opinions of others. In my inner self and not in the opinions of others. Lies true victory. Lies truly victory. I live in the assurance of God's truth within. I live in the assurance of God's truth within. In my inner self and not in the opinions of others. In my inner self and not in the opinions of others. Lies true victory. Lies true victory. Now a little more quietly, taking it further within. I live in the assurance of God's truth within. In my inner self and not in the opinions of others. Lies true victory. And now as a whisper, taking it into the subconscious mind, I live in the assurance of God's truth within. In my inner self and not in the opinions of others. Lies true victory. And now mentally only, focusing at the point between the eyebrows, taking it into the superconscious mind. I live in the assurance of God's truth within. In my inner self and not in the opinions of others. Lies true victory. Pray with me mentally. What matter if people blame me? Of what importance is their applause? I live to please thee, Lord. 
confident that when thou art with me, I am protected. Om. Peace. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our family and friends online. My name is Sita Reed, and I'm here with my husband, Ramurti Reed, and our wonderful techies and support group from, who are doing the chanting this morning. I'd like to read to you from this reading from Rays of the One Light, called Many Are the Pathways to Truth. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. On the dedication page of Swami Kriyananda's book, The Path, appears the following account. A group of Paramahansa Yogananda's disciples had gone with him to see a movie about the life of Gyandev, a great saint of medieval India. Afterwards, they gathered and listened to the master explain certain subtler aspects of that inspiring story. A young man in the group mentioned another film he had seen years earlier in India about the life of Mirabai, a famous woman saint. If you'd seen that movie, he exclaimed, you wouldn't have even liked this one. The guru rebuked him. Why make such comparisons? The lives of great saints manifest in various ways the same one God. The Bible contains a similar account in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 9. And John said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is with us. The more central a truth, the greater the number of contexts in which it can be applied. Truth is like a pure white light, containing within itself the full spectrum of the rainbow. Let no one tell you what your path to God ought to be. Many are the paths. Select your own according to the dictates of your own nature, no matter how out of step that puts you with other people. Sri Krishna in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita states, trying even unsuccessfully to fulfill one's own spiritual duty is better than pursuing successfully the duties of others. Better death itself in the pursuance of one's own duties. The pursuance of another's duties is fraught with spiritual danger. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. Live stream land. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read from Whispers from Eternity, which is a book of Master's prayers and poems. Universal Prayer in the Cosmic Temple. 
with a myriad of living thoughts of devotion. I have built thee a temple of awakened silence. I have brought the multicolored lamps of wisdom from all valid faiths. They shine with the luster of thy one truth. The commingled incense of human craving for thy love soars up in spirals from the incense bowl of our hearts. Thy sacred presence shines on altars everywhere. All prayers of all temples, tabernacles, churches, mosques, and viharas are chanting to thee in the universal language of deep love. The orchestra of our combined feelings plays in harmony with the chorus of all soul songs, with the cry of all tears with the bursting shout of all joys and with the united anthem of all prayers. In this wallless cosmic temple of the soul, we worship thee, our one Father. Be pleased to reveal thyself to us always. Amen. Om. Amen. This is a great subject. I love it. I think there are people who come to this path simply because it's so open. And while it itself may not be eclectic, it's wide open to other religions and other paths. One of the most urgent needs of the world today is for the major religions to be presented from a perspective of the truths that they have in common rather than focusing on the things that may be different between them. Proponents often insist that my religion's unique or my religion's the best. And that contributes to the situation we find ourselves in around the world. So what an urgent need this perspective is. When I was a kid, junior high and high school, especially uh, well, all my childhood. And, and later I was a part of a religion that was, could accurately be defined as fundamentalist and evangelical. And one of the great challenges that I had then was the fact that we were supposed to go testify to witness for the Lord. And sometimes that meant going out and knocking on doors, cold calling. And, <laughs> Then hoping you get inside and then hoping you could actually finish what you were going to say before they kicked you out. <laughs> and, and, and that was a great challenge and I, I always felt badly about it, but I always thought it was just because I was anxious or I was scared. And it was so nice to find a path that told me I was right. That <laughs> I didn't have to be going to those doors and knocking on them or trying to convince people to do things that they didn't really want to do. We know so much energy has gone into books, and theses, and music, and movies pushing the fact that my way is, is the right way. But there's just, you know, there's another so much truer aspect to religion than that. And that is that it does not have to be divisive it itself can be unity, can be uniting. And there are so many points that almost every religion agrees on. Now, for example, the issue of right action. Where is the religion that says, oh yeah, you really should be stealing? Yeah, anyone that you can, you should beat up on them because that's gonna make you feel good for a little bit. I mean, that's not what's there, right? The key, the heart of the religions our right action. And although this might be challenged by some today, uh, almost every religion has some version of the golden rule to treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. Now, most religions have their name taken in vain by some adherents who put out their own 
whatever it is, insecurities, their own aggressive feelings, and organize and do it together. And they're around the world. There's uh, ISIS. There's Christian identity. There's the Barang Dal. I mean, there we have them in Islam and in Christianity and in Hinduism. And so they exist and they're there and they're creating situations, as I said, around the world that, that are terrible for all of us. But in great contrast to these religious oriented groups and leaders, we have sometimes you know, towering religious personalities who are taking a very different approach. Uh, a few years ago, the Pope was holding a prayer service at Ground Zero in commemoration of 9-11, which just went by not, not too long ago. And he invited the leaders uh, from many different prayer uh, faith communities to come and join him. And up on the dais, he had people from 10 different religions. And you, and you could tell just by observing them that at least there was a Buddhist and Hindu uh, represented from uh, Jewish religion, uh, Catholic, of course, and Protestant and Russian Orthodox. And there, there they all were. And it was so sweet because the Sikh woman who was there, uh, who gave the opening prayer, was pregnant. And she asked if the Pope would bless her child. And she did there, he did there, and, and blessed her and the child in front of that whole huge assembly. And so we are fortunate to be living in a time where there is some enlightenment, a time where the, I think, movement into Dwapara Yuga, you know, is bringing us more energy and more and more people are being open-minded and it's critical that we be that because we have so much ability to communicate and travel and mix all around the world. I mean, the time is now for us to get our act together in that way. Ramakrishna was a 19th century uh, saint in India and uh, he was much admired and beloved by Yogananda. And he believed, and this is now, what, uh, 170 years ago, he believed that different religions were made to suit different aspirants, you know, different times, different countries, or different cultures. And he taught that any religion can be a path to God, but the path, we have to be careful not to worship the path. We worship we use the path to worship the divine. He, uh, he, he was such an interesting man. If you ever want to get a kind of an entertaining spiritual read, read some of the uh, books written about him. And what was so interesting was that he knew that different paths could lead to God because he practiced a wide variety of paths himself and found God through many paths, many different paths. He spent his whole lifetime doing that. He worshiped Vishnu and did that under the guidance of a female guru, which was very unusual in, at that time. And, um, he, and it was the path of Tantra. And he also uh, became completely absorbed in the consciousness of Hanuman and felt that he was the divine monkey king. The Hanuman spirit entered him and activated him. But he also worshiped Mother Mary, you know, as the mother of, of Jesus. And he spent a long time in the practice of divine friendship emulating uh, Lakshman from the Ramayana, Ram and Lakshman. And one of the most interesting and curious ones was that he, he uh, followed the path of the love of Krishna, which was done by Radha and the gopis. 
right? And so he completely became this female personality. And for six months, he dressed and lived as a woman so he could completely fulfill this devotion to, uh, to Krishna. And the stories are really interesting. And there, there uh, were, he went and lived with a group of women and just was accepted by them because he so personified that because he felt he needed to fully embrace that to be able to completely love Krishna as Radha and the gopis had done. Well, he, he uh, worshiped God as the divine child, just like um, we have reverence for baby Jesus. And he found God uh, as a Muslim by following the Sufi path. And as he uh, was getting uh, close to death, one of his devotees came and read stories uh, from the Bible, from the New Testament to him extensively. And then Jesus came and visited him. So he could declare from direct experience that as many faiths, so many paths. That was his, one of his mottos, as many faiths, so many paths. But the harmony of religion, as we're reminded just by looking at that partial list of what Ramakrishna did, is certainly not uniformity. You know, it's unity in diversity. It's not a fusion of religions, but it's more like a fellowship of different paths, but with a common goal of being able to unite with God. You know, while Master, while Yogananda was alive, he called each one of his churches the self-realization church of all religions. And that just wasn't a, a way of you know, putting the name on the building or something like that. That's what people called them in those days, the Church of All Religions. Peggy Dietz was his chauffeur for a number of years. And he, her first contact was when someone came and invited her to go to a Church of All Religions. And she was like, that did it for me. I, I was going. I had to find out. what this because that aligned with her own internal understanding and experience. But it was very difficult in the 40s to find that available. And you know, in the Hollywood Church of SRF, they have two pulpits. And if you've been there, you've, you know, you've seen them. And there was a reason for the two pulpits. Master wanted the other pulpit there, he said, so that the, his organization, Self-Realization Fellowship, could have a minister and there could be a minister from another religion there as well. Now, how often that's happened, I'm not sure. But there it was in the design of that church. When uh, Ananda, some of you know a bit about Ananda's uh, background, but for about the first 10 years, we were pretty insular. We were just out in the woods uh, in the Sierra Nevadas doing our thing together, dedicated to finding God, but dedicated to us finding God. And at the end of that 10 years, Swami said, much to the chagrin of many of us, OK, guys. You know, we've had it good here for this time. You've had a chance to grow and get to know the teachings and all. Now, out you go. Well, the first foray out was to Sacramento, which seems scary enough, although it seems absurd now. Go to Sacramento, and we rented a house that had a fairly good-sized garage, and we turned that garage into the first Ananda temple out in the world. And we called it the garage of all religions. <laughs> but that's where this worldwide work started, the garage of, of all religions. Joseph Cupertino is a, a fairly well-known uh, Catholic saint. And he had the unusual characteristic, especially when he gave mass, but other times too, of just levitating. He would be so filled with the spirit. And uh, whoever was in, in charge, the abbot, when he was in the monastery, or someone running the church, get the other much quick, go get him. Because they had real trouble if we went all the way up to the top of the church. And so sometimes he gave mass with a monk on each leg, holding him down. This was not a popular thing in the Catholic Church because most of the other churches and the other parishes all around where Joseph of Cupertino was 
were empty on the, on the Sundays and other times of giving mass because everybody wanted to go just in case Joseph started to rise and, and, and see that. So eventually, poor man, he got exiled, basically. But while he was off in his little cell, kind of remote from everyone, uh, ambassador uh, to Italy from Sweden uh, was able to get through to see him, who really wanted to sit in, to see him. And they talked and chatted together. And at one point, <coughs> St. Joseph, Joseph of Cupertino reached over and took his hand and then started to rise. And lo and behold, the Swedish ambassador rose right up in the air with him. And afterward, when he was telling the story, the Swedish ambassador said, you know, I went up a Lutheran, but I came down a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all valid, and they all work for the person who has the heart filled with devotion and is committed to finding God. Now, one of the things that's the most important about this whole discussion is not only are there a lot of different religions that are valid and a lot of kind of subcategories of religions. There are many denominations and other groups within re each religion whose paths are valid. And even within those kind of denominations or subcategories, there are other groups. And it's all good, but the most important thing about this is that we each have a path that is our own. I mean, when we talk about is this path valid or is that path valid, for every seeker that there is, there is a path that is different to some degree than every other seeker. Swami was giving a class up at the meditation retreat on the Hong Sa meditation technique, and it was a question and answer period. And one person said, you know, I'm a devotional person. I feel so much love. I just can't concentrate. I, I usually feel just like focusing on God rather than beginning the techniques and the practices. Isn't it okay for me just to practice devotion in my meditation times sometimes? And Swami said, no, no. Your devotion will be greatly strengthened if you use the techniques right away as soon as you sit down and start to meditate to help you focus your mind. And just two or three questions later, someone said, you know, when I sit to meditate, after I finish the part where we pray to the masters, I just feel so filled with love and devotion for them that I just want to sit and meditate on the masters and, and only begin my practices much later if I get to them. What should I do? And Swami says, yes, yes, you should definitely go with the devotional feeling. <laughs> Follow it where it leads you. And of course we know that happens, but this is great because it's on a recording that you can listen to and it's just right there. And he, you know, he doesn't say anything like, oh yeah, I told that other person. That. It's no, no, it's just like, you should do this, and you should do this, and the fact that they're exactly opposite, you know, I don't have a problem with that. That's what you need to do on your individualized personal path. So very different people and in very different situations may have their paths be different. Uh, you think about Saint, uh, not Saint Francis, Pope Francis, that is the, the Pope now. And I was reflecting that for 800 years, I, I think that's about right, since Saint Francis came, there's been 800 years worth of popes, what, probably more than 100. And yet not one of them chose Francis as a name. And here he's an outstanding you know, saint, leader, in his way, leader of, of the Catholic Church, nobody took his name in all that time. But this pope was elected and took Francis. That was his path. That was the example and the model he needed to live his life to serve people the best. Uh, we can look at our own master and guru for most of us, Yogananda. We're going to broaden it out a little bit, but just beyond his life. But if we look at the 
two other incarnations that we know about him here in the West, we know that he was William the Conqueror, or William the Great, we prefer to call him, but he was William the Great, and that was in the 11th century. And then he was also Ferdinand III of Spain in the 13th century. And of course, we know him as the spiritual guide and the bringer of self-realization at, at this time. Well, those lives were very different, very different from each other. And yet that was the same soul, the same God-realized soul even, that had these paths that varied so much. As I was thinking about it, I realized that all three of those lifetimes, though, were dedicated to certain types of unifying uh, missions. They were there to, to bring people, or in some cases governments, countries, together. And of course, his, his role now, those first two were that way, and his role now is to do that on a spiritual level. All three of those people were known for having incorruptible bodies, too, after, after they died, which is interesting. Okay, so we're all individuals. We all have individual pathways, and God deals with us each individually. But that doesn't let us off the hook. I mean, it's not like you can just go ahead and do whatever you want. Say, hey, this feels good. I think I'll do this now. Well, no, my path. Oh, well, let's do that today. Let's go over here. No, it's not something that's just totally self-created from the whim of the moment. There are lots of paths, and there are lots of souls walking them. But if you want to be on your own true path, you have to involve the divine to find that path to identify that path, to express that path through you. We have to develop our path. We have to learn about ourselves, our strengths, our weaknesses. We can look at those who've gone before us. We can see what God has offered us right now, you know, where we are in this moment. Here we all are in a self-realization um, uh, church service. Other people are other places today in, in church and not in church. And that's where they are. That's what the combination of Divine Mother's will and their response to it have brought them. So we need to learn and create our own path. What is it that Krishna said? Much better to fail in pursuing our own spiritual path than even being successful on somebody else's. So we really can't look over and say, oh, that person's doing really great. They're doing really well. They're doing this practice. I think I'll try that. No, we have to touch base with Divine Mother and be sensitive and receptive to what is right for us in that situation. So what's called for in this? Courage, because we're not always going to get what we want. Self-confidence, maybe above all else, attunement. Attunement, tuning in to the divine. So we know embracing all that we're given to help us move forward on our path. The circumstances, the circumstances around us in life, the people that we have in our lives, making good choices and always trying to spend more time with, with God and Guru. So we have something to be receptive to. We have to explore our own dharmas. You know, Mother Teresa said, when someone asked her, a journalist asked her, now have you, have you met most of the goals that you have, when, uh, that you set out when you started to help the poor and work with the poor? And she said, what goals? I had no goals to help the poor. I'm only doing it because Jesus asked me to. That's the only reason. And once I clearly heard him ask me to do it, I just plunged in without any idea of how to do it. So it's being receptive and then being willing to follow through. I mean, many of us will pray, you know, 
What do you want me to do? I'm serious about you, God. What is your will for me? Should I be a fireman or a teacher or accountants? Or should I change jobs? Or should I retire? Should I try harder to get a relationship? God doesn't really care about those things most of the time. What God wants to know is, do you love me? Do you, will you expand your love for me now? Are you willing to still come and, and commune with me to go into a quiet time and pursue the path until you find me? And even beyond the fact that we each have our own individualized paths, our paths will change. They'll change over time. It's not that God's different. It's not that the goal's different. And we're trying to go someplace different. But our paths will change because we change, because we grow, because we find ourselves in diff different circumstances where our needs are different. And that's why attunement is so important. We need to see our path more like a river than a road. It flows, it shifts, it changes. We may have to hang on tight while it jumps its banks because of some big storm that we're experiencing. But above all else, we want to flow with it wherever it's headed. A strong commitment to our truth must never stifle further development. We must never remain satisfied with what we know right now or what we've developed right now. We have to be open so we can flow. And when our river's going this way, we're not shooting up on the bank and missing the right direction that we're supposed to go. So I'll, to close, I'll give two little practical tips that will help us in this. One is let's be more childlike. Enthusiasm for each new challenge and opportunity that God gives us will take us very far in being able to understand and explore the path that's before us. We need to welcome those changes. We need to go for them. You know, We need to be galloping ahead in that way. And in the long run, this is what defines our path for us is moving forward with the guidance of the divine. So let's be eager, more childlike, ready to go, ready to grab it. And secondly, let's increasingly live in the here and now. You know, focusing on what's happening to us right now as opposed to what we wish were happening or what happened yesterday. Let's focus on now and embrace what's right in front of us with good cheer. This suggestion on how to live and how to approach, uh, how to approach life comes from a very uh, erudite, one of the modern era's greatest philosophers, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and Winnie the Pooh and Piglet are out in the woods and they're taking a walk and Winnie the Pooh is seeing, really seeing everything that passes in front of his eyes and ears. As he hears the humming of the bees and then he looks and sees them. He can smell the fragrance of the flowers and he looks over at that and he sees the beauty of the butterflies flitting around. And then a thought occurs to him and he says, what day is it? Piglet says, today. <laughs> and Pooh says, ah, my favorite day. 